Is this the first question? No. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not answering that one. <laughs> Everybody, how's it going? Welcome to another episode of Ask Firebase. I'm your host, Jen Person, and today my co-host is Lawrence Maroney, and we're gonna answer your burning Firebase questions. Okay. Shall we just love dive the right pun, into it? Burning Firebase questions. Yeah, I get it. I love I, a good pun. I'd never thought of that one myself. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on and uh, answering some questions with me today. I'll do what I can. Let's see what our developers are asking about. Let's see here. Scroll, scroll. Oh, let's start with this one. Vibav Fuke on YouTube asks, if I am a beginner to Firebase, let's assume, okay. should I start with Firestore or the real-time database? Oh, that's a really good question. I love that question. The easy answer to that question is, it depends. Yeah, sure. <laughs> right, because it's like, it really depends on what you want to do. Yeah. And you know, the, the piece of advice that I usually give is that if you're used to existing databases, like relational databases, those kind of things that have, you know, tables and indexes and structures and that kind of thing, it's probably less of a bump for you to go straight to Firestore. I can agree with that. Because yeah. it has that kind of document collection thing. If you don't have existing database knowledge, or if you're used to like, you know, working with data in JSON documents, as like a lot of web developers, you know, for them, real-time DB is just the perfect fit. Absolutely. You know, having had past experience with JSON documents, it, it, it felt just really comfortable first learning real-time database. And it was actually kind of fun to learn, you know, all about denormalization. So um, Either of them you can start with, right? They're mm -hmm. both very, very easy. They both work like effectively in real time. For me, like I come from a relational database background, so it was like kind of square peg round hole for me to start using real time DB. Uh, but then I got to really enjoy that. But now that I'm going back to like the Firestore type stuff, I'm, I'm actually having a lot of fun with it, like querying and documents and all that kind of stuff. It's, yeah. it's pretty cool. Yeah. Oh, and we, you know, we have uh, code labs for both of them, so you could. Why not both? Yeah, why not both? And they're, they're both code labs you can do like in half a day, right? Yes. So spend half a day doing both of them and then choose what suits you. Sounds good. Let's uh, let's see what we got next. Keep going. I, I answered that one too. That was a weird question. Okay. Why not? <laughs> We're gonna do this one. <laughs> so our next question comes to us from Twitter, and Andrew Walpole wants to know any way to link a single user to auth into multiple Firebase projects. Uh, so the same user across multiple Firebase projects? Right now, no. Mm -hmm. Right, but there is probably one thing you can do. I'm, I'm guessing what your scenario is, and that is like, you have the you want to be able to sign the user into multiple applications, and these multiple applications, each one is built with a particular Firebase project. So if you sign your user up and you're uh, they're using like the Google ID and you're using Smart Lock for passwords, once they've signed in the first time, then subsequent sign-ins are invisible. So you could actually build it, and like, so they sign in using their Gmail ID, right. so their Google ID, and then uh, once you've like, there's a simple API for you to store that in Smart Lock for passwords, and then subsequent times they open, they sign in right away. So you can kind of get the same effect. Like if you got ten apps, you sign into one, you're in. You sign into the next one, you're in. You sign into the next one, you're in. And then subsequent times you open them, you're just directly in. So while it's not the single user being synchronized across multiple Firebase projects, um, we don't support that yet. Um, at least you can. Have have a good user experience for a user being able to sign into multiple applications that you've built. Mm -hmm. But I really like getting these kind of questions too because it shows us a lot about things developers want to do with Firebase and gives us a good direction for the project. So like yeah. uh, these are great great questions that people have. Yeah. And that's how we drive the direction of our products. Absolutely. We can learn as much from you as hopefully you can learn from us. Great. The next question comes from actually from Ufi, who I was sitting next to during the uh, Firebase Dev Summit. Oh, you were? Yeah, yeah. Oh, so, nice. hi. Hey, um, Ufi. Where can I find out more info on Firebase and GDPR? This question comes up a lot from our developers, especially anyone who wants to have their app in Europe. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's important to have that kind of protection, right? So I know Francis Ma spoke a little bit about it during the keynote at the Firebase Summit, and mm -hmm. I believe there's there's a website, and I think we have a link in the comments below. Oh, yeah, look at that. Now, magically, we have a link. Thanks. So yes, where can you find out more? In the links below. So the next question comes to us from Stack Overflow, and uh, it's a pretty long one, so I'll just summarize <laughs> that essentially we have a developer who wants uh, users of the app to be able to submit quotes anonymously, but they don't want just anybody to be able to access that data. They just want, uh, you know, 
users of the app. So they want to know how can they protect that without forcing people to sign in. Yeah, so we, we do have the concept of anonymous users. Yes, that's what I was thinking, exactly. And I'm wondering if we could do something like that. So the idea behind an anonymous user is that the user entity is still treated as they are a user within the database. So security rules can be applied to them, mm -hmm. that type of thing. So, uh, you know, so they don't need to sign in with a username and password or anything like that. But security rules can still be applied to the concept of an anonymous user. So I think that kind of thing might be able to be used. For yeah, that. I think that makes sense to me because not every app necessarily needs to hold on to so much of the user's information, but it's still a good idea to be able to know who's using your app. Right. So that's where the idea of anonymous auth is really useful. And I think this would be a great way to uh, make sure that not anybody is using your app. Yeah, yeah, and um, another great use that we have for anonymous auth is that a lot of times you want to give uh, data to users of your application who are signed in, mm -hmm. and but you don't want them to sign up before they can have an experience of using your application because if you ask people to sign up, they may go away. So the idea is that you can have one set of data from your application that's available to anonymous users and then another set of data that's available to signed in users. So now the anonymous users will get that experience both when they're signed out and then after, sorry, before they sign up and then after they sign up when they get both sets when they're actually signed in. Right, yeah, so you can actually convert that too, right? So once they sign in as a, let's say with email and password, you can hold on to that data. Exactly, exactly. So it's like kind of for trial data, yeah. that type of stuff. Because, I mean, how many times have you gotten an app, right, and it asks you to give all your personal information before you can even use the app? And then I just delete it. Exactly. Yeah. So it's like that's the, <laughs> one of the cool things about this is like maybe, I don't know if it's a sports application or something like that, and you want to see scores, you don't need to sign up to be able to see the scores, but if you want to go into some details and like see a box score or you know see details of the players or something like that, then you have to sign up. At least you've had a like an experience before you sign up for it. And you know, that's what anonymous authentication gives you. It's pretty cool. Absolutely. I use it a lot when I'm testing things or trying to answer questions from mm -hmm. Stack Overflow. Like again, if I have my Firebase project that I'm just testing things out on, it's so nice to just be able to do anonymous off because I don't have to set up a whole authentication scheme and, and all these views that I'm not necessarily going to use, I can just right. boom, be authenticated and still know that the data isn't just publicly available. Yep. So I have a question about a new product, Firebase Predictions, uh, and my you're my go-to guy for that. So I would like to know, is it possible to set up a prediction for any kind of analytics event? Oh, I see. That's a really good question because mm -hmm. it, it can be a little bit confusing. Um, the type of predictions you would set up would be for conversion events right. uh, rather than any analytics event. And a conversion event is something that you can define manually. So technically, it can be any analytics event, but it will only be the ones that you define as a conversion event. And the reason for that is pretty obvious when you think about it in that um, there are you want to be able to predict the major things in an application mm -hmm. lifecycle. So for example, if you're building a game and the game has n levels, but you realize that once the user has played three levels, they're going to be hooked and they're going to play the game for the rest of the time, then it's a case of you would say, once they've passed level three, I'm going to set that as a conversion event. And then I want to predict you know, which users are going to hit that, or many ways more importantly, which users are not going to hit that. And mm -hmm. the ones that aren't going to hit that, then I can provide some kind of encouragement for them to keep playing the game until they hit that. And then once they've hit that, I know they're going to continue playing the game forever. Got it. So you'd want to set up some conversion events. Those would be the major happenings in your app that uh, keep a user. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Keeps them engaged, and it's just engaged. it's it's a little switch that you hit on the Firebase console for that analytic, and it's as easy as that. I mean, that sounds great. I am super excited about predictions. I mean, that makes so much of the developers' work so much easier. You don't have to guess. It's, yeah. What a time to be alive. Oh yeah, and we're only getting started. Yeah. Well, Lawrence, thank you so much for coming on and answering some of these Firebase questions with me. Always a pleasure. Thank you. And thanks for all the questions. If you have a Firebase question, make sure that you post it on social media or Stack Overflow with the hashtag Ask Firebase, and maybe you'll see it on a future episode. And if it's a really difficult one, don't tag me in it, please. <laughs> you were tagged in one of those questions, yeah. All right. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. See ya. I like it. Isn't this nasty? It is. It's classy. It's got far basic.